The stereotype of the Chicana is the nurturing woman. As women, our role is to provide a social and economic support system. We free men to work while we prepare the future labor force. We are the preservers of the culture. And although we work, we are not paid wages for our work. If we refuse to do this, Respect of woman comes late in life. Respect is the recognition of woman's strength to endure the hardships of life without complaint. These are traditional images of the Chicana. But the life and history of the Chicana is not so simple. Historians Ignore the matriarchal roots of the Americas. They ignore the great mother. She is the throne of life. She who takes life away. Guatlique. She reigned as early as seven centuries before the height of the Aztec civilization. The great mother, Guatlique, goddess of the earth. Gives birth to life and devours death. Pre-Columbian artifacts reveal more than a treasury of Mexican Indian feminine deities with power over life and death. They may lead us to the time when authority and property rested in the communal hands of women when private property was non-existent. A time when the great mother gave in abundance to her children. History speaks of pre-Columbian women prior to the arrival of the Spaniards. These women domesticate vegetables which we now take for granted. They are the paramedics of Aztec society. Like many in the Aztec Empire, women are also slaves and suffer from economic, military, and religious subjugation. It is 1519. Spanish conquistadores land in Mexico in search of gold and silver. They find a people revolting against the slavery and tyranny imposed by the Aztec priests. Many of the oppressed Indians unite with the Spaniards in hopes of gaining their freedom. The Tlaxcala nation offers 12 virgin slaves as tokens of this alliance. One of these slaves, Malintzin Tenepal, acts boldly to gain her freedom and becomes an interpreter between Mexican tribes and the Spaniards. 
The Spaniards call her Doña Marina. The Indians, La Malinche. But she becomes the symbol of a ravaged Mexico, for the overthrow of the Aztec rulers does not bring freedom. According to the policy of the colonial Catholic Church, the largest banking institution of Mexico, the worship of the Indian goddess of creation, death, pain, and abundance is transformed into the praying mother of pain. And the ideology of Marianismo the veneration of the Virgin Mary, proclaims woman as semi-divine, morally superior, and spiritually stronger because of her ability to endure pain and sorrow. It guides and controls woman's action to serve the ruling class by demanding that woman's primary role be to reproduce and ensure the labor supply for the patrones. The hacienda leaves a colonial legacy, the throne of the patron, the image of machismo. The patron. He controls the lives of all. His dominance assumes superiority. the protector, lawmaker, and he is the exploiter. Marianismo and machismo, the colonial tradition of a colonized people. It is 1610. Colonial rule is maintained from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Coast. By 1793, there are some 20,000 colonial settlers in New Mexico. Half are women. And the life of these women? For most, it is similar to other colonial settlements and varies according to geography and social class. Among the Pueblo nation, women's work is highly valued. Mexican women are taught to be enjaradoras. They plaster adobe for the missions and also for the homes of the common folk. In the ranching aristocracy, women supervise the mestizo and Indian servants. Yet the struggle for civil liberties and for freedom is also a part of the legacy of each Mexican woman and man. The medieval 17th century, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, the 10th muse of Mexico, is a passionate believer and writer for the rights of women. She defends for mujeres the right to education in her autobiography entitled La Respuesta, or The Reply, However, her ideas are unwelcomed. Threats of investigation and inquisition come from the church fathers. Sor Juana must finally give up her only wealth, her library and writings. 
not until 1871 do women gain the right to higher education in Mexico. And today, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz is the symbol of women's struggle for education. Josefa Ortiz de Dominguez is another celebrated woman of Mexico. In the 1810 independence movement led by Hidalgo, Josefa is sentenced and imprisoned for her participation and commitment against exploitation and slavery. Still, misery and slave peonage continues even after independence has been gained. Fifteen years after independence, Mexico is challenged by the Yankees, and Sam Houston declares, The Anglo-Saxon race must persuade the whole southern extremity of this vast continent. The Mexicans are no better than the Indians, and I see no reason why we should not take the land. In 1836, Santana, the president of Mexico, grants Texas its independence in exchange for his freedom. The Mexican-American War begins 10 years later, when General Zachary Taylor invades Mexico. By 1848, New Mexican lands are territories of the United States. Powerful individuals and corporations take over the land from the Spanish aristocracy in the Southwest, and the exploitation of the pueblo and mestizo peasants is continued. Women and men rise against this new aggressor. In Brownsville, Texas, Estefana Cavazos loses her land to the Yankee settlers who are protected by General Taylor. In defense, Estefana shoots all strangers caught trespassing. And many Texas Rangers meet their death, sipping poison at the old woman's tea parties. Or at the hand of her son, Juan Cortina, leader of the Texas Rebellion of 1859. 1873. Industrial development creates a demand for cheap labor which in turn stimulates working men and women to unite against unfair working conditions and slave wages. Lucia Gonzalez Parsons, one of the leaders of the growing labor movement, reminds men that their co-workers are women and that they must always support and organize for the issues of working women that the ruling class uses the wages of women to reduce the wages of all working people. The struggle against exploitation also grows stronger in Mexico as the corporate giants begin to control Mexico's industrial economy. By 1910, a revolutionary consciousness is ignited throughout Mexico by such people as the Magón brothers, Las Adelitas. Some women disguise themselves as men, like Valentina Ramírez. Some attain the rank of general, like Carmen Robles. Middle-class women join political groups such as the Women's Socialist Brigade. In their cause, all see liberation as the outcome of the revolution. Dolores Jiménez y Muro, author of the Plan de Sierra y Guerrero, writes for the equal distribution of land for both men and women. She points out that every individual should enjoy full rights of citizenship and rather than depend on marriage for a livelihood, women should have an independent economic base. However, 
the Zapata Plan de Ayala omits these ideas and grants land to all Mexican citizens and their wives. Women are still denied citizenship outside of marriage. The people's struggle leads to the formation of a new constitution in 1917. And although progressive, it does not stop the already growing control of the rich who claim to govern in the name of the revolution. Promises of the revolution are frozen. Coupled with the bad economic conditions of Mexico and the new demand for cheap labor in the United States, migration of the Mexican peasant north of the Rio Bravo grows rapidly between 1900 and 1930. As the Southwest makes the transition from a rural to an industrial economy, women join the working ranks. Owners of garment factories are beckoned to Texas with the promise of cheap, unorganized labor. One third of the women who work in the Texas garment industry are Chicanas. They earn as low as $2 a week for a 14-hour day as domestics or in laundries while some men earn $2 a day working on the railroad. Women are the cheapest source of labor, and so our traditional role as homemaker is extended into the labor market. In the face of tremendous hardships, women take the lead with male co-workers. In 1938, Emma Tenayuca leads the pecan strike in San Antonio, Texas. Wages are cut and workers from 130 plants strike in protest. Emma organizes the strike, files a suit against the city hall, and is victorious. However, nowhere are wages cheaper than in the fields. many are deported on payday. From the Beat Workers Association of the 1920s to the United Farm Workers of the 1970s, farm workers struggle against exploitation and fight for the right to unionize. Dolores Huerta, a leading crusader, is the first vice president of the United Farm Workers and a tough negotiator in working out union contracts. There's so much that we can do, but the first thing is that we have to make our, up our minds. Number one, I'm going to make a commitment for, to justice. I'm going to make a commitment to help people with my life. And that's a really important thought because uh, our lives is really all we have. In 1968, Alicia Escalante organizes the first Chicana welfare rights organization. She fights for the access of social services for those of low income, the unemployed, and the welfare recipient. There is a widening gap of communication, and I'm dismayed to see that. We are forgetting that in order to regain our rights of freedom, of opportunities, we have to stay united. The employment, training, educational, and social needs of women in the Los Angeles area are served by the Chicana Service Action Center, a grassroots organization founded by Francisca Flores. Today it is necessary for her to continue to struggle uh, to achieve an education, to achieve uh, skills that will enable her to participate in the total community. High school dropouts, welfare mothers, women laid off from work, abandoned wives, women over 40, even college graduates are in search of employment. Today, 11% of all working women are in the factories. 28% of them are Chicanas. They earn about $3,200 a year. However, 
the struggle continues as we arm ourselves with progressive ideas and actions to combat exploitation. And like workers all over the world, we fight for better wages, decent living conditions, and education. We fight for bread and roses. <laughs>